Hi, ladies, this is Stacy Kemp, and I'm excited to be with you for this last week of our Bloom unit on the Book of Ruth. I'm so excited to be here. I wish I was with you in person in the warehouse. I was so looking forward to that. Much preferred to be looking at your um, faces and interacting with you than to be doing it this way. But I'm so thankful that we have this technology and the ability to do this um, so that we can continue on and um, it's just good to be with you. I've been a, a small group leader in Bloom since I moved to Little Rock from Seattle in uh, 2012. And I just love, love, love this ministry. And it's just really fun to be with you. And before I get started, I wanted to um, show you a picture of my family. Um, my husband, Jeff and I um, will celebrate 38 years of marriage next month. Um, and that is just a huge God story in and of itself. Um, and then if you're looking at the left of the picture is our third son, Colby, his wife, Paige, and their little girl, Parker Lee. And then next to them is our daughter-in-law, Julie, our youngest son, Keegan, their little guy, Ezekiel John, who's affectionately known as EJ. And in the picture in July, she was two weeks away from delivering um, a granddaughter of ours, Savannah. Next uh, is um, our second son, Corey, his wife, Dana, and their little girl, um, Callie. And then last on the end is our daughter-in-law, Lindsay Ann, our son, Kyle, and their little guy, Jack. Um, and I didn't tell you, when we first moved here, everybody lived in a different place. We had every time zone covered. We had uh, Seattle, Colorado, Dallas, and New York City, and us here in Little Rock. And so everybody's starting to get a little closer. Our youngest son lives up the street from us in West Little Rock. Um, our oldest just moved from New York City to Nashville. Our third son is interviewing um, with the Fayetteville Fire Department, hoping to get hired there so they can move from Colorado um, to Arkansas. And then our um, second son and his wife and little girl live in Seattle. So we're still kind of spread out, but people are kind of starting to migrate closer and we're thrilled about that. Um, before I get started, I wanted to show you this quick picture of Jeff and my wedding day. Um, like I said, next month will be 38 years. I got to thinking about this with our anniversary coming up and Valentine's Day having just passed and realized that I've got some similarities to Ruth in uh, my story um, and how I now have a husband. So I wasn't a widow. I didn't have um, a mother-in-law that was looking out for me, trying to find me a husband. But I did have a very concerned mother that was trying to find me a husband. Um, I committed my life uh, to following Christ as a freshman in college at the University of Southern California. And um, I was dating someone my junior year. I was just kind of moving through life and growing and, and going through college. And um, we broke up right before the summer, um, before my senior year. And so I got to thinking, this is not a bad thing. This is good. I'm going to go home. I'm going to get involved in the college group at my church. I'm going to grow and find out what God has for me as a woman apart from anybody else. So I went home and announced that to my family for the summer. My mother was completely distressed that I was going into my senior year of college, no husband prospect and no desire to date. Um, I guess I thought I went to school for an education. Apparently I was be looking for a husband. So one night she starts reading our little local newspaper to me and she says, Stacy, here's the perfect guy for you. And she starts describing this guy that's trying out at quarterback with the Los Angeles Rams football team. She loved quarterbacks for some reason. Uh, she said he must be intelligent. He um, graduated from Dartmouth College. And then she says, his dad's a congressman, so maybe he's from a good family. And she said, you'll like this part. It sounds like he might be a Christian because Jeff was the fifth quarterback in camp. He was a long shot to make the team. And they asked him about it. And he just said it was in God's hands. So um, I did not say a word. I didn't want there to be any kind of an argument or anything. I was just trying to be calm. And a couple days later, something inside of me just happened to get me to look at the newspaper article and read it and thought, um, wow, that was pretty cool that he spoke out like that. Not common in those days, all those many years ago. And I decided to write him a letter, which was my bold move. I didn't lay at his feet in his dorm at training camp, but I did write him a letter just to encourage him. And I told him that I'd read and that he could probably have an impact on kids by sharing about God and that I'd be praying for him. And I started praying for him twice a day when I knew he was practicing. 
And then a week after that, I was at a college gathering with church, um, met some guy who ended up inviting, just happened to invite me uh, to come. He was getting some of the guys he knew from the Rams Bible study um, that had a night off the next night to some girls from church to go out in this group date. And he invited me to bring a girlfriend and come, which I did. And Jeff happened to be there, which was absolutely crazy. Um, and we started dating, got married. And I really just have seen since the way he brought us together. Jeff was from the East Coast. I was from the West Coast. And he brought this, these two people together. And it's been really helpful throughout our marriage. One, it started me off on a track of knowing that God was in control and he was sovereign and orchestrating things. And two, it helped me when we got into those snacks because we are very different people. And marriage has been somewhat tough for us. And yet I knew that God brought us together. He had a purpose and a plan for us in a way that he wanted to use us. And he has done that in the lives of people um, that have some struggles in their marriages. So um, those are just kind of my little comparisons to Ruth. And that was just for fun. Now, um, I don't know. I'm an avid reader. I love to read. And one of the saddest things for me is when I'm coming to the end of a good book, I almost slow down and don't want to finish it because I know that when I finish reading, I am not going to be able to look forward to reading the book anymore. And I feel that way about Ruth. It's just been such a sweet book for us to study and, and so many lessons that we can learn from it. And I thought I'd do just a quick review of the book. There's a lot to glean from it, which is pun intended. <laughs> but uh, week one in the intro, Carrie shared with us that God's kindness is for our redemption and for our eternal good. She, she encouraged us to look at the big picture, um, the eternal side of that. Um, the reality is we live in a fallen, broken world where there's um, highs and lows and brokenness and joy and disappointments and suffering all along the way as we're moving through life on our way to our eternal home. And um, I did a Bible study a number of years ago by Catherine Martin, and she just talked about the eternal perspective is the ability to see all of life through God's point of view and have what you see affect how you live in the present. And I just love that. That is just, it sums it up that, that God has a purpose. He has a plan um, and he's working that out and for an eternal purpose, not just um, a temporal one here and now. In week two, Emily, as she was talking about um, the first chapter of Ruth, she um, reminded us that God is always at work even when we don't see it, and even when we don't feel it, he is working, and that he has purposes and plans for us, for our good and his glory, um, that he's working out, and that we need to learn to trust God's goodness, his kindness, his character, um, sometimes over our feelings, just because we know what he's doing. Some of my favorite verses in the Bible are Romans 8, 28, and 29. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What a great thing. What he is doing in our lives is wanting to make each one of us more like Jesus and conform us to the image of his son. And he uses all those things in our life. If we are loving him and wanting to be called according to his purpose and what he has for our lives over maybe our plans that we think are best, um, that he's going to mold us and shape us. Emily also shared that God created us to be his image bearers that we're to know him, to become like him, and to represent him to others. And we saw pretty clearly as we were looking um, at the book of Ruth that what we do and say matters, that our character matters, and that people are watching. We, we looked at the fact that Ruth must have watched Naomi um, in her life, in her marriage, and in the way she worshiped her God in order to choose to come with Naomi um, to Bethlehem. And we also saw just great things that were recognized, not only by the characters in our story, but the people in the village, both Ruth and Boaz were honorable and uh, had lived lives of integrity. They, Ruth was hardworking, as was Boaz. 
Boaz and kind and generous and humble. Um, and we see through their example, the importance um, and impact of our example as Christ followers to those around us whether it be our children that we're raising, um, our husbands, um, other relatives, friends, grandchildren, if we have them, um, neighbors, even strangers, people are watching and it matters that we live our lives um, in a way that brings glory to God. In week three, as Carrie was talking about chapter two, she reminded us that we need God's power in order to extend God's kindness to others and that we can't do it on our own. And it just makes me think of 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. That that is where it starts with his incredible love for us and what he's done. And we need that um, power and reminder of what he's done to be able to extend that to others. Now, last week, Ruth chapter three um, left us hanging and a bit disappointed after Ruth's secret soiree to the threshing floor to propose marriage to Boaz. Um, we, I don't know about you, I was really excited that um, they were finally going to get together. It looked like things were going to work out for Ruth, um, but like most romantic movies, there was a snag. They hit a snag. And it looked like it was going to unravel and our hopes were dashed. Um, Boaz had to explain to Ruth after he was flattered about her marriage proposal that there was a kinsman redeemer that was closer to her than he was. And he assured her that he would work it out um, in the morning. And so she went home, Naomi agreed that he would do that because we know that he's an honorable man and he would do what he said. Um, so the good news was the fact that Ruth was either be redeemed by the closer kinsman redeemer, or she would be redeemed by Boaz himself. So either way, we know that her future is secure. Now, one thing we need to remember when we're studying the Bible is the fact that God is the hero of all the stories. God is the hero of this story in the book of Ruth. And it's so important for us as we're studying the Bible to be looking for that, looking, what is God wanting to reveal to us about himself? Um, what does he want us to know about our relationship with him? And so that's what we're going to look at today. And before we get started in Ruth chapter four, I'd like to pray. Father, we come to you, Lord, and we just thank you and praise you for this time that you're giving us together. We thank you for your word that is just so rich and tells us about you. You are on every page of the Bible. And Lord, I ask that you would just um, have your spirit speak through me, that you would help me to handle your word accurately, that you would um, open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to the truth of your word, and that you would just illuminate your scripture scriptures as we go through this chapter now. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. If you have your Bible, I'd love for you to open it to um, Ruth chapter four. I'm just going to kind of read through it and uh, talk about it as we go through and just some observations. So it starts in chapter one. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down and there behold, the redeemer of Boaz had spoken, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. Now, this just sounds to me like the way Ruth just happened to get into Boaz's field. Uh, this kinsman redeemer that Boaz spoke of, as soon as he sits down, this guy just happens to walk by. So Boaz says to him, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Obviously, Boaz was a respected man in the town, which we've already heard. And Boaz took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Now, Boaz was in, at the city gate. That was um, kind of the, the, the hub of the, the village or town um, in those days. It was where people came to see one another and meet and greet. It was where um, business dealings were taken care of. It was where legal things were handled. And so in this case, 10 witnesses was important uh, to this story and to any dealings to have 10 witnesses. And the fact that they sat down and were seated, that shows authority. And it makes me think about when Jesus was sat down at the right hand, hand of, of God. He, that was a place of authority where he is sitting. Then Boaz said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. 
So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And so the closer kinsman redeemer says, I will redeem it. So basically, he's just giving him this opportunity to buy the land. That's what redeeming is, buying it, paying a price for it. Then Boaz says, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So all of a sudden, there's a, a different piece in there. And the Redeemer says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So he initially, when he thinks he's just getting to buy the, the land that belonged to Elimelech, he is willing to do that. But as soon as he finds out that Ruth, the Moabite widow, is a part of that, he makes a decision that he doesn't want to do that. Um, that could be for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, this land has been sitting for over 10 years. Nobody's done anything to it. So it's going to require an investment of cash and paying workers to get the, the land ready so that they could plant seeds and then have harvest where it would become, start making money for them. The other reason is because if um, this kinsman redeemer marries Ruth and they have a son, then all of that in order to perpetuate the dead and continue the lineage and do what is right in the way that they did things, that son would inherit that piece of property that this other man would have spent money to invest in and get ready. And it also could mean that not only would that son inherit that property, but he might also get a portion of the redeemer's property. And so this man just kind of looked at it and made a business decision, very practical, much like Orpa made a sensible decision when she chose to go back to her country and her family. That's what this man is doing. But it opens the door for Boaz. Now, this was the custom in former times. I'm in verse seven in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So basically, the sandal is just part of um, a, a contract. We would sign a contract. Both parties would sign. There might be a wit witnesses to that, um, just making it legal so no one could dispute it in the future. So the thing with the sandal, um, in one commentary I read said, you know how as you put your feet in your sandals and you take them off, especially if you've had them a while, um, your imprint of your foot is there or maybe the outline of your toes or something. Um, so what they did by giving the sandal, it, it was kind of a marker, kind of like a thumb or fingerprint. Um, and so the one person that made the purchase would, or that relinquished the land would give the sandal to the other man. And then um, if there was ever a dispute, he could take those witnesses back, Boaz in this case, could take the witnesses back and go look at this man's sandals and see, no, this matches. He was the one that agreed to this. So in verse eight, so when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have brought, bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. So true to Boaz's character, he is wanting to do this all in just the right way. Um, and so he's going through all that he's doing, that he's purchasing the land, that he's purchasing Ruth, and that the, his plan is to perpetuate this um, land for the, the dead. So that means that should Ruth have a, a son, he's going to allow this land to be his, and it's continuing the line of Elimelech and Malin. Verse 11, then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. So Rachel and Leah, you remember, are sisters of 
uh, sisters of one another, both married to Jacob, who later is named Israel, renamed Israel. And together with their two maidservants, they bore 12 sons and one daughter. And those 12 sons became the fathers of the tribe of Israel. And Judah was one of those sons, and his land is the land um, that is in Bethlehem. And so that is what um, is continuing to be perpetuated here. Uh, the elders go on to pray, may you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And they're, they're speaking of Boaz, and that we know they're praying it here, but it's already come true. Boaz is famous. He's in the book of Ruth, and we know him, and we um, know of his character. He is indeed worthy. He's spoken of as such. And so the, the first kinsman that was closer, he's not even named, so we don't even know him. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. He went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. So God has opened Ruth who's been barren for 10 years and gives her a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. So they're acknowledging that God is the one that is doing all of these things in this story. Yes, he used Boaz, but God is the one that's giving um, Ruth a redeemer. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. So I just think of what the joy that grandchildren bring. They restore us to life and they nourish us. It is so much fun. It brings us back to our youth almost. And I can just see that in uh, Naomi's future with this granddaughter. I love the fact that they, these women that kind of watched Naomi and Ruth come into town um, saw that um, that Ruth has been really good for her. They say, your daughter-in-law who loves you, they acknowledge how much she loved um, Naomi, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. So seven in the Bible is a number of completion and perfection. And it was the most blessed thing for a woman if she could have seven sons. It was just a, a huge blessing from the Lord. And so they're even saying that Ruth is better than seven sons in Naomi's life. Verse 16, Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, which means servant or worshiper. He was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. Na Naomi's gone from being from bitterness to joy, from empty to full. Her arms are full, her heart is full and her future's full. Uh, life has replaced death. Hope has replaced despair. Naomi has definitely experienced the hesed, the steadfast covenant uh, co loving kindness of the Lord in very tangible ways as we've watched throughout this story. Imagine the love that Naomi had for her grandson Obed and all that she wanted to share with him. Uh, she has learned so much. She suffered much but she's been given much joy. There's a lot of um, comparison to, to Job's life where he suffered much, but then God restored him and restored um, his family. There's a great verse in Job, the last chapter of Job, uh, chapter 42, verse five. Uh, Job says to the Lord, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Basically what he's saying is that I had heard of you, I knew of you, but now I really see you because I have experienced you. I have experienced your power and your promises and your pr protection and your um, redemption and, and rescue. And it's the same that can be said of Naomi. And sometimes that's where we learn the most, ladies, is when we go through difficult times. I know that's true in my life. Some of the toughest, toughest times are some of my favorite as I look back, because it's what really pushed me in God's arms, into his word, learning and growing, and then learning him in a new and fresher and even bigger way that he's there and he's taking care of me and he has purposes and plans in my life. And I just can't help but thinking Naomi passed down all that she had learned about the Lord to her grandson, Obed, 
who then, as he grew up and had children, passed that down to his son, Jesse, who, when he grew up and had children, passed that down to his son, David, who became the king. But before David was king, he suffered much. And you just see evidence in the Psalms of him crying out to the Lord, Lord, save me from my enemies. I'm trapped. He was hiding in caves. He knew they were trying to kill him. Saul and his men were trying to kill him. And he feared for his life. He had periods of depression. He would despair and he would cry out to the Lord and he would tell the Lord all of those things. And then in many of these Psalms, there's a point where it comes kind of in the middle where he, he changes and all of a sudden he says, but Lord, I know you are good. I know you are kind. I know you are loving. And he begins to just share the attributes of God and his character and, and relay things that he's done in the past for the Israelite people. And as he does that, his perspective begins to change and he moves out of that despair and into hope. And he begins to praise God and it just changes his whole perspective. And that is such a help. And it's such a great lesson for us to learn. But I really wonder if it wasn't things that Naomi had taught that had been passed down through those generations. The, uh, the book ends with the genealogy of David. It says, now these are, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David, the greatest king in Israel, who then from his line came our great Messiah and the king of kings. And all of this is what God intended to do, to have our great Messiah come from this line. Now, Rachel shared that Boaz is a picture of Christ as our kingsman redeemer, and let's just look, kind of, we can draw from things that we saw in Boaz, and we can pull that out. And I want us to look at this right here. Jesus is worthy, ladies. He is so worthy. No one is worthier than he. Jesus is our provider and our protector. He extends his steadfast love and kindness to us. He fills us up, and he gives us rest. He gives us a secure future. He's made eternity available to us. Um, he calls us his bride. We are the bride of Christ, and we one day will be reunited with him in heaven as the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's our redeemer. He has bought us with the price of his precious blood, just as Boaz bought Ruth. And so how do we respond to that? It's incredible what he's done for us. And as Ruth did with Boaz, we lay ourselves at the feet of Jesus. We surrender our lives to him. We take refuge under his wings. He is our protector. We can take refuge there. Let's run to him in our times of trouble, in our times of suffering, in our times of grief. Run to him in his word and take refuge there. We are his humble and willing servants. Just as Ruth humbly served, we can humbly serve the Lord in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, wherever he places us. Let's just have willing hearts. And ultimately, ladies, we can trust him explicitly. He is faithful and he is trustworthy and he is all powerful and in control. I want to close by sharing a story with you. Um, several years ago, Jeff and I were invited to come to um, the mountains to a retreat center in uh, north of Albuquerque um, for, to speak at a marriage retreat. And so I was looking into our um, airplane reservations and everything and realized, wow, it's really crowded. There weren't many flights left. What's going on? And then I, it made me think we had friends that had lived in Albuquerque that had once told us about the international um, hot air balloon fiesta that took place annually in Albuquerque. And I, I looked it up. Sure enough, it was there. So I said, Jeff, why don't we go in a day early and we can um, just drive around Friday morning. We'll go in Thursday. We'll drive around Friday morning. I'm sure if there's that many balloons in Albuquerque, we'll be able to see them. And we got one better than that. The people that invited us to speak knew a balloon pilot from their church. And so he hooked us up with him. And this guy was the nicest guy. He came and got us Thursday night. And he took us to what's called Glow Fest, where all the balloons are tethered to the ground, but they're um, on and glowing. The fire is in. And so the balloons are glowing in the night and the darkness. So we were um, 
just hanging out in his car and driving over to the place. And um, I just casually said, I would never go up in a hot air balloon. I don't like heights, I'm scared of them. I don't really like to fly. I do all the time. Um, I ski, but I don't like the chairlifts. I mean, I just really have to pray. I don't know why I'm a woman of faith, but things like that scare me. So we were talking as we were together for several hours that night. And just I peppered him with questions. I was so curious about how he'd become a balloon pilot and he'd grown up, his dad had been one. And, and what's the certification process like? And, and what do you do? What do you need to know? How does it work? Is there air traffic control? Have you had any accidents? I just asked him everything I could think of just because I was curious and wanted to learn. So he invited us to come the next morning early, early, early to um, be part of his chase crew that would go within a truck and, and be at the end to help pick the balloon up and everything. So we thought, okay, cool. So we got up in the dark and went over there and uh, the balloons weren't up yet because there were winds that were too strong. And so they weren't sure they were gonna be able to do it. And Jeff and I were just roaming around watching the balloons that were lying on the ground. And all of a sudden balloons started to inflate. They turned their propane or whatever they use on and the balloons were starting to go up in the air and the baskets. And we said, wow, we better get back over to our friend and see what's going on. So we raced over there and he, his balloon was up and ready to go. And he said, hey, why don't you jump in and get a picture um, with me? And we thought, great, that's fun. So we jump in, get a picture with him. And I can't remember what was said, but all of a sudden I realized I was going up in a balloon and I did not want to. I wanted to jump out like Toto jumps out at the end of the Wizard of Oz. Um, and then I had another thought. I thought, oh, what if I jump out and Jeff goes and dies, then I'm gonna to need to speak the whole marriage retreat by myself. And then I thought, but if we're both in there, then there, neither of us are there to do the retreat. I mean, I just had all these crazy thoughts. And I finally just thought, you know what? I guess I just, God wants me to trust him. And so I was just praying like crazy. I was scared to death. I was holding on for dear life. Jeff has pictures. It's, you can tell how scared I am. And I finally, once we got up in the air, I started to like get a little more comfortable. We hadn't fallen out of the sky yet. And I started to look around a little bit and it was a beautiful sight. It was unbelievably beautiful and so incredibly peaceful. And I ended up enjoying myself um, surprisingly, um, I thought we'd been up just a short time when we, we brought the balloon down, but as it turned out, we'd been up there almost an hour. So we thanked him, had a great time, went up to the retreat. Next morning, I wake up early at the retreat center, and I was just kind of thinking about what had happened the day before, and I just thought, what possessed me to go up in that balloon? I just could not even, I just couldn't fathom it, and then it hit me. I went up in that balloon because I had had the opportunity to get to know that pilot. And I, I learned all about him. I learned about his record, his safety record, how per, the precautions that he takes. His um, friend that had been with him told me what a careful, careful guy he was. And I just got to know him and learned the process and it made me able to trust him. And the same is true in our lives, ladies, that the more we know God, the more we know about him, his, what he's done, um, his character, his attributes, the stories from the Bible that we can see how he's uh, taken care of his people throughout history, stories in our own lives um, that we can look back on, which is such an important thing for us to do and to remember how he's cared for us in the past and use those as deposits for how we know he'll take care of us in the future. But it's so important for us to spend time in his word. And I'm so thankful for this unit that we had where we got to study um, the book of Ruth. I'm thankful for the framework that Carrie has given us, uh, that we can just take our Bibles and find some quiet time of our day and open them up. And whatever book or chapter we are on, we can go through these steps. We can read and jot down what we see happened in there, just the facts and the happenings in the story. Then we can go to understanding. How did it affect these people? How, what, what difference did it make? What did it mean to them? And then we can go to the application part where we can look and say, how does this apply to me? What am I learning about God in this? What am I learning about my relationship to God? What does he want me to know? And how does he want me to use this in my life? And I just can't encourage us enough to treasure his word so that we can trust him because he is faithful. Let me close this in prayer. Father, we come to you and we just thank you and praise you for how much we, you love us. 
um, help us to love you and to appreciate you and to just have a desire to be in your word and to spend time with you. Thank you for all you taught us about um, the gospel and the message of Jesus through the story of Ruth and seeing it in Boaz's life, Lord, as the redeemer. Father, thank you that um, you have loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross and that he was buried and your power raised him from the dead, that he, he, that he spread his precious blood for us. That is such a sacrifice because of your incredible, steadfast, covenant, loving kindness. We love you, Lord, and we thank you and praise you for um, your love for us and help us just to um, want to know you more. In Jesus' name, amen.